Hey guys, welcome to the Affiliate Builder Podcast. If you join us today, today we will be talking to the co-founder of Electric Books Works, Book, Book Dash, for better care, and is the host of How Books Are Made, which is a podcast about the heart of about the art and the science of making books. His name is Arthur Artwell. Arthur, welcome to the Affiliate Builder Podcast. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. So, guys, um, today I would like you guys to to um, to look out for some of the tips and pointers that we'll be sharing, which is going to be about how to write a book and publish a book, and hopefully um, also pick up some tips on how to to possibly write and publish a bestseller as well. So, no pressure there. Um, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> no pressure, Arthur. All right. Cool. I thought, I, I just want to jump straight into this, right? Um, yeah. I want to firstly just learn a little bit about you and just to learn how you got into books. Yeah, good question. I I was kind of born into it, to be honest. I grew up in a home where we were so lucky to have, I'm not kidding when I say thousands of books. My father is a keen historian and theologian and, uh, and my mother is a keen reader and they had inherited their parents' book collections. And to be honest, like I just remember as a child, entire floor to ceiling books, more than I could ever read. And yet I was actually quite late to reading myself. Uh, in primary school, I would read a lot of kind of Asterix comics and so on, easy things. It took me a long time to, to find the kinds of books that I really enjoyed reading. And then once I did, well, it was kind of, I was gone from there. But Later on, uh, my mother became a book publisher uh, when I was in my teens, and I got kind of involved with that. And there's something magical about the making of books. They are some of the most complex things a person can create. You know, if you think of a book of 50,000 words, that's 50,000 things that can go wrong. It's a wonderfully complicated problem to solve the creating of a book. And I love solving problems. So it suits me really well. And I've been making books now for must be over 25 years uh, since I was a kid, really. Yeah. Is if you if you didn't go into books, what would you be doing right now? Wow, yeah, I mustn't let myself think about that too much, or I uh, <laughs> might, <laughs> might want to run at something else. I think that it would probably be games. You know, develop the development of games. I think that the the stories and the interaction and the bonding and the human connections and the creativity that goes into creating games is a lot like books and is, is just so exciting and interesting to me. I've always been a big enthusiast around games and by games, I mean everything from, from sport to board games. Uh, so I think the, the part of our humanity that gets excited and rewarded by going on a journey with someone else through something that is, purely about enjoyment and creating a story together is it's just such a wonderful thing to be able to enjoy and to be able to create those experiences would be would be really special books are a kind of game that you play on your own uh, and i imagine that if i hadn't been in books i hope that i would have found my way into some something similarly creative uh, in the field of creating some of the stories and journeys in other ways that's wow that's really interesting man and for a person that's listening right now that wants to write a book, that hopefully wants the book to sell, that wants to publish the book, how can a person go about writing and publishing a book that could be a bestseller? Mm. So I want to start off by kind of with a little disclaimer that if I knew how to create bestsellers, that's probably what I would be doing, right? <laughs> so <laughs> what I know about creating books and best, and it's particularly ones that would sell is from seeing other people do it and helping them along that journey, uh, particularly with the production side. So my particular speciality is the, the physical design, editing, making of the book. And I have been involved with the making of hundreds and hundreds of books over my career. So seen a fair bit. I also think there's no such thing as advice. There are just other people's stories and you get to decide which of those stories resonate with you and which ones you want to try on in your own life. So with those little disclaimers out of the way, I think that there are 
two places to start if you think that you want to put a book in the world. The one is to not think about it. Just start writing. Just write. Whether you're typing into a computer or writing on a pad, just get writing. And then as often as possible, go back and reread your writing and improve it by editing. So the writing, editing, writing, editing process is the heart of bookmaking. It is exhausting and thankless and frustrating and depressing. And when it starts coming right, when you start seeing your writing improving through your own rounds of editing, it becomes exhilarating and exciting and it builds your confidence. That's the one way to do it. The other way to do it is to think very carefully in advance and plan everything out before you write anything. I don't think that that is a good way to do it. I think it's better to just get stuck in, start writing, get stuck into the editing phase. But a lot of us do need to do a bit of planning so that we know where we're going. And if you are going to plan ahead a little bit, whether you've started writing or not, then the first question to ask yourself is, why am I publishing this book? And that seems like an obvious question, but I'm going to give a few potential answers that I, I get from people when I ask them that, because I have clients come to me us all the time at Electric Bookworks and say, we want to make a book. My first question is always, why do you want to make a book? And one of the answers is, I want to make a lot of money. That is usually a bad answer because that is not something that happens <laughs> for the vast majority of writers, right? If you happen to make money off your book, that's fantastic. Good for you. You won the lottery. The chances are, that that's not going to happen. Uh, so if you're only doing it for that, you're going to have a hard journey. The second possible answer is there is some other strategic reason in my life or my world why I need a book in the world. One of the most common is that you need to be recognized as a thought leader. If you've got an area of expertise and you want people to recognize that you are an expert in that area, there is almost nothing more powerful to show a person than a book and particularly a printed book with your name on it, particularly if it's sitting in a bookstore, right? If you can point to a bookstore and say, look, there's my book that I wrote. There is something that happens in the human brain that makes you seem like an expert, whether or not it's true, right? It's quite possible <laughs> yeah. that half the experts in the world that with books and bookstores actually don't know what they're talking about. But the fact that they have a book in a bookstore means they've ticked this huge box in all our brains that says this experts. person can be trusted. Mm. This is an expert, right? So that's the second reason is for strategic reasons, I need this book in the world to recognize myself, to be recognized as a thought leader. Another reason is I just want to tell my story. In other words, something is, I've been on a journey that I need, I feel an inner deep compulsion to have written down so that someone else can read it. It almost doesn't matter if someone else does actually read it. What matters is that I have expressed my journey and I've, I've uh, put it in the world. That is a very important personal journey. There are a great many uh, writing workshops and probably therapists and psychologists who would say that's a very important, empowering thing for a person to do, particularly if they've come through a traumatic experience. To be able to write it down, get the story out is good for the brain, good for the soul. So that's a perfectly good reason to publish a book and going through the motions of writing everything out, making it readable, putting it in a book packaged form and making it available to other people in itself is, is a valuable thing. And then I think the last reason, which is sort of related to that one that I hear a lot is that I want to leave something for my family. Um, so a lot of people are writing stories because they want to capture their family history or they want to explain their own lives to their children for whatever reason. Um, in other words, they feel they have a story that they don't need the whole world to read, but there are special mm. people in their lives, either personal or professional, who they need to have access to the story or to be able to read it. And, uh, and those, those are probably the four reasons I, come, I hear the most. So just to recap them quickly, I want to make money. Uh, in other words, I want to sell this book. Uh, two, there's a strategic reason. I will need to be recognized as a thought leader. Three, I need to just have my story in the world for my deep, for a deep inner reason. And fourth, there are specific special people in the world who need to read my story. So I think understanding which of those four or which of some other reason that I haven't thought of now, you have for writing a book is an important first step 
because if you're going to write a book, you're going to be making thousands of small decisions along the journey of writing that book. Every word you write is a decision. Hmm. Every connection you make, every chapter heading you pick, how long you're going to make literally thousands of decisions. And the more you can align all your decisions in one direction, the more successful that book will be at achieving its purpose. You have to understand what the purpose of your book is, which is what comes back to those reasons. If you fully understand the purpose and make sure every decision is aligned with that purpose, then you have the greatest chance of, of that book making sense and doing the work in the world that you need it to do. Let me pause there for a moment because I've been going a while and, <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm just something like, you want to dig into there. No, no, like I, like you've you have touched on, on basically so many points there because I've literally gone through through some of those, uh, some of those because I because um, earlier you know I told you that I am also writing a book, and I've gone through some mm. of those decision um, steps myself. Where for me the reason why I'm writing my book is. One, because um, I have this knowledge that I want to share, um, you know, about the things that I've learned in, like, in my life. And it wasn't something I learned, like, my, my whole entire life. So something that I happened to learn, say, in the past three years that has made me a very happy person, a very calm, um, to, that has made me feel alive. And that didn't just happen by chance. That happened through reading over 70 books in a space of six months where I had like this breakthroughs. And I'm like, wow, I'm pretty sure that the me before now would really appreciate being able to break down the past three years of my life, you know, the, the, and the things that I've gone through into a book and be able to sort of like give me this guidance and be like, hey, listen, hey, listen, you took it three years, but then that breakthrough happened in the last, in the last couple of um, weeks of you just mm -hmm. like hammering hard, reading a book a day to try to just solve this problem that you're having mm -hmm. and you got this breakthrough. And I'm like, I need to put that down and I need to just help other people that are just like myself three years ago. So that was yeah. one. And two, it's like, it's like, um, so one of the first steps that I went through was start a social, you know, um, start writing a lot of the things I'm learning on social media. And at the same time, I'm also, I also want to be seen as an authority because I can't just go from being an entrepreneur to a guy who gives people advice on happiness. Who the hell are you? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So then I, then, then I was like, you know what? In order for me to be seen as a scientist, because I've I studied as 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 a scientist, and mm. and in order for me to be seen as a specialist, say, and because I also have a master's degree, I need to write mm. a thesis. And the thesis, mm. after I produce the, produce the master's thesis, it's like, oh wow, you're an expert in this particular field. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. I've done, I've literally sort of written a book before. So all I have yeah. got to do to be seen as an authority in what I'm talking about, because I know what I'm talking about is write a book and publish mm -hmm. the book, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. so, so on that second point of yours, that's basically where I am, which is like a okay, cool, publish the book. Yeah. And then at the same time, because I've put in so much time into writing mm -hmm. this book <laughs> and spent, you know, and spent money. Also, mm -hmm. I'm, also I'm also a businessman where I'm like, of well, course. I want to get back my, I want to get a return on my investments for my time and money mm -hmm. I've spent. So how about you try to make sure that, that you sell enough books to cover, to at least recuperate all the costs that yeah. I've had over the past couple of, over the past couple of um, months, year and a half. So make try to try to make sure that that you study all the bestsellers so, so then i just started reading um new york bestsellers and just studying right. how all of them were written how you know like how like how they how um how the writers start how they finish and just and just learn 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 read as many yeah. of those as possible and start applying a lot of those like a, a lot of the patterns that i've seen and i've noticed into the book yeah yeah I think that what you've 
hit on there is is one of the most critical parts of the writing process is reading is reading as much as possible and learning as much as possible uh, i think that that's absolutely the most fundamental thing you know i, I uh, at university did a, a master's my master's in was in poetry and creative writing i'm sometimes embarrassed to say that because when you tell people that you write poetry they think oh goodness geez <laughs> that comes the yeah it comes a melodramatic hippie yeah. <laughs> but um but some of us take it very seriously it's a very serious craft and i remember uh early in in my journey one of my probably my greatest mentor the late stephen watson saying to me the only way to learn to write poetry is to read just read and read and read and read you should be reading a hundred times more than you're writing uh, because there's so much to learn about how people execute it well and uh, and enjoying out the best lessons that apply to you. So yeah, that's the way to do it, for sure. Do you think topics, do you think the title of a book has a huge part to play in a book actually becoming a, a, a bestseller versus not actually becoming one? I think it is really important. Uh, I don't think that it's the single most determining most factor. Yeah but I think it really is critical for a whole number of reasons. Um, the first one that we all think of, of course, is does the title intrigue people and make them want to read the book? That's obvious, right? And these days though, it's not just that, it's also the title of the book is deeply tied into the marketing and sales strategy that you're going to be using uh, for selling your book. So it gets really complex if you think too much about it. One of the fun stories from the real world of publishing that um, that I, I like to tell is about how Tim Ferriss, the best-selling author of The 4-Hour Work Week, and since then many other books and his extraordinary mm. podcast, uh, The 4-Hour Work Week was not his original title for the book. I think his original title was something like Selling Drugs for money fame and money or something like that <laughs> it was completely ridiculous and he just wanted to be cheeky and fun but what he had the good sense to realize was that his idea of a good title as the author was probably wrong because once you're deep into a book you're the writer it's very difficult to get to step back and get perspective on your book from an outside point of view and to see where it fits into the world you're just too deep in it by then so what he did was he developed, I think, with the help of, of his editor or publisher, uh, and a whole number of titles, I think at least four or five that they really liked, which itself was a shortlist from many more that they tried. And then he bought Google ads with each book as the main text in the ad, and then waited to see which ad got the most clicks. And it was a very simple rudimentary way of saying which of these phrases makes people willing to spend their time to click through and, and see. And that's, that's really, really critical. It is not helpful to ask your friends whether they like your book title. They will always tell you they like your book title. Uh, or it, if they're a different kind of friend, they'll tell you something else that they think is a good book title. It's just as terrible or worse than the one you thought <laughs> because they like to have an opinion. You're not gonna get real market feedback. What you want is the feedback of people who are actually investing something, ideally money, but if not, then time and attention in your title. And that tells you what's actually possible. In the end, the four hour work week wasn't even accurate to the book. In fact, I think Tim Ferriss was originally writing a book around working only two hours a week, but the title, the four hour work week did the best on his data. So he went with that. So a long way of saying that I think the title is critical and, but I think you need to approach it scientifically and you need to be very deliberate about taking the advice of, uh, of any data you gather and of actual industry professionals. We've had many clients over the years at Electric Bookworks. And just to mention it, what Electric Bookworks does is we're not a book publisher in the sense that we don't invest our money in authors and brands. What we do is we get hired, we get outsourced to, to do the design, editing, production of the books and increasingly the strategy around what these books should do and be in the world by publishers or organizations who need to act like publishers. Mm. And they come to us and they say, we need a book in the world. Tell us how to do it. What should we call it? What, what do we need to write? How does it need to look? What formats should it exist in? Where should we sell it? How should we distribute it? And so on. And we figure out that strategy for them. And very often, particularly when there's one author 
who therefore has great sense of ownership over the book. They love this book. It's their own expression of their inner selves. They have an idea of the title in their heads. Sometimes the same thing applies to a cover image. And we say to them, what we need to do is we need to test the market with these titles, with a number of titles and a number of covers. And one of the things we're going to do is we're going to show it to the managers of bookstores. Because the managers of bookstores, they know what sells and what doesn't. They don't feel personally attached to one cover over another. Their job is to get customers to actually spend money on books. So they, to my mind, have the best sense of what covers and titles sell best. Let's show it to them. And whatever they say is the best title or cover, we'll go with that one. And I can't say how many times that data comes back and that author just refuses to listen to those booksellers. They just think, nope, I know better. The booksellers are just wrong about this. I'm going with my own cover and title. And it's impossible to know because at the end of the day, the book only has one title. You don't have a control trial where you get to see what, how the titles would have done. But I guarantee that on covers and titles, to my mind, looking at those books, when the author has not taken the bookseller's advice, the book has had a harder time selling. Mm -hmm. So get the advice of actual professionals who have no vested interest in pleasing you, whose only interest is in selling the book to give you real advice. Ooh. I could talk a lot about titles, but... Uh, <laughs> but it's, uh, who are those professionals? Who, where do we find them? To me, I think it's... To me, the people who work in bookstores are the, are the first port of call. And... Um, they get asked this a lot, so it's sometimes hard to get their time and attention, which is fair enough. They, they've got businesses to run themselves, uh, but I would say they're the place to start. Uh, there are also companies that will help with self-publishing and self-publishing advice. I think there you have to be a little bit careful because a lot of them um, have great skills at straight book production, just laying the book out, designing it, and, uh, uh, and so on, but haven't necessarily worked in the book selling industry yet. For me, it's the, the key is to find someone who's actually worked in a bookstore for a long time um, to, to help you with that advice. You know, I'm actually going to take uh, different cover, cover samples and I'm going to go to different bookstores. I'm going to yeah. put, you know, I'm going to be like, hey, choose one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I totally think that's the way to go. Another thing we can do these days, which wasn't you know, possible even a couple of years ago, is uh, for very little money, run adverts on with images on places like Facebook, where for literally like 50 Rand or less, uh, you can upload say two or three cover images as if they were ads and would treat them like Facebook ads for your book. Uh, and um, see which ones get the most clicks, literally yep. just see like which covers are appealing to people. What are they Pro actually? So you can run your own data. Yeah, uh, testing pretty easily. I think that would work so well during the pre-order phase of your book. Yes. When your book is yeah, in pre-order. Yeah, good idea. Hmm. Fantastic. Yeah, also good. Pub Publishing is a funny thing in that a lot of us spend a vast amount of time and money on our books uh, before we get any real market feedback on whether this thing's going to work or not. So as odd as it may seem, the earlier you can start getting feedback on your book, on titles, on covers, even before you started writing, try to find a way to get that feedback. It's a lot like uh, the philosophy and entrepreneurship of the Lean Startup. There's that famous book by Eric Ries called The Lean Startup that really defines this approach, but it's much bigger than Ries's philosophy. The, the general idea is that before you invest vast amounts of time and potentially money in a new business, you need to figure out what is the simplest assumption your business is making around its product and test that assumption in the simplest way possible. One of the examples he uses is this uh, team, it was a couple of friends who wanted to build an app that would help people uh, find specials at supermarkets in their city um, and would then sort of say, okay, you know, Pick and Pay has got specials on this and Checkers has got specials on that and here are some recipes you can create for your like, cooking for your family based on these specials. So that the whole, this whole vision for this app in their minds, right? But before they built anything, before they wrote a line of code or did any designs, what they did is they went and stood in the parking lots of some supermarkets and with a clipboard and stopped people as they walked out of the supermarket and said, what did you buy uh, today? Had them tell them and then said, cool, if I come back tomorrow with a recipe for what you could cook with the stuff you bought today on special, uh, would you be interested? Would you be like, and, they were, and some people were like, okay, cool. Yeah, sure. So the next day they went back, gave the person the recipe. After a few weeks, they said, if, if I did this tomorrow, would you, would you give me a dollar for the recipe? 
And that was the next test. Would people actually pay money for that information? Hmm. And eventually they grew that into the app, but they started with literally standing in a parking lot with a clipboard. And it's just such a wonderfully simple way of thinking about what is the equivalent when you're writing a book? What's the first thing you need to test about what you're telling people? Do you need to do a magazine article, uh, a series of blog posts on, on a Facebook page or a LinkedIn page? Uh, do you need to put these cover images on Facebook and see what people click or Instagram, see what people engage with? Uh, because with both business and writing books, the only thing you can be sure of is that you're going to be wrong about something. And the sooner you can figure out what you're wrong about, the better. Uh, because if you figure out, if you discover what you're wrong about too late, then you've wasted your time and your money. It's, that's, that is very good advice. Well, as I say, I, I don't have time to write books myself, but I would like to think I could follow that advice if I wrote them, but I'm not think, I don't think it's easy. <laughs> it's still a very hard thing to do. <laughs> so tell me something, right? How does a person in South Africa, I'm going to, I will just limit this to South mm -hmm. Africa, get a publisher for a book? Mm, good question. Uh, so there are many different kinds of publishers. Most of us think of the bigger ones because the ones we hear about or they see their logos in bookstores. So we think of things like places like uh, Penguin, Random House and uh, Strick and uh, Jonathan Ball um, and these big names. The fact is there are very few publishing companies and a great number of people writing books. The bottom line is that your book needs to attract the attention of someone at one of those companies. Now let's break that down a little bit. If you're a publisher, in other words, you're the person at one of these companies that has to decide what to publish, you probably receive maybe 50 to 100 manuscripts a month at one of the big publishing companies, probably a bit less than that at the smaller publishing companies, but it's still far more manuscripts than you could ever read. And it's a good you know, 50 to 100 times more than you could ever publish. And so you're making very hard decisions. You have to essentially find uh, simple ways to quickly tell which from this humongous pile of submissions you've got from authors, uh, which books are, are good first. Not, and then in addition to deciding which ones are good, which ones are you able to actually make a success of? So people love to tell the story of how JK Rowling was rejected 27 times or something before she got a publisher for Harry Potter. And we all think, oh, the idiots who turned JK Rowling down missed out on millions. I don't think that, right? The way I look at it is that every single publisher that turned down JK Rowling knew that they couldn't make a success of this. And that was on them. That was them admitting, I myself don't feel that I can do this book justice. And it's important whenever you get a rejection from a publisher to remember that what that publisher is saying to you is that, I'm sorry, like, we're not the team. We're not the team that's going to make your book a success. You're going to have to keep looking for that combination because the success of a book is very much depends on the, if you're publishing it through a conventional publisher, on the chemistry between you, the author, and the publisher themselves. Okay, so what does this mean for you as the writer? What it means is that what you're looking for is the publisher where you're most likely to have that connection and where the book you're writing suits what that publisher clearly is good at making a success of. So if a particular publisher is very good at making a success of, you know, real life crime stories, then don't send them your self-help finance book because they can't make a success of a self-help finance book. It could be the best self-help finance book ever written. That publisher won't be able to sell it and you'll all be wasting your time. So the first thing, and this is hard work, is the research. It's literally standing in a bookstore, finding all the books that you think are like the one you want to write, and then seeing what publisher's logo is on them, looking up that publisher and, and looking on their website for their submission guidelines. Then you've got to decide what are you going to write to that publisher. So now I found a publisher who can, who I think is the right person to make a success of my book. What are they, what do they want to see that's going to make them spend two more minutes on my proposal than on the next one on their, uh, in their massive filled inbox full of publishing submissions. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's something where I don't have any obvious clean advice for, right? You've got a sense for yourself. What is going to 
excite this person? Usually you need to prove a couple of things. One, you need to prove that your manuscript is, that your writing its style itself is captivating enough that the, that the publisher feels there's something to work with there. That doesn't mean you have to write in some like fancy literary fashion. What it means is that you just need to have taken care that, um, that your, that when, that your writing makes sense and is compelling um, to other people to read. And that's where it comes back to the editing process I mentioned earlier, constantly going back and improving and editing your work, You're crossing paragraphs out, rewriting them, rephrasing sentences and so on. The second thing that you have to prove to them um, is that, um, and this is a bit of a con controversial statement, but I don't think, I don't think it's avoidable they have to prove to them that you're going to make their marketing job easier, that you are the kind of person who will help this book sell just because of the, your force of personality or your connections or the way you are talk about yourselves. Because it's always been the case, but it's particularly front of everyone's mind right now that half of the work of marketing a book is up to the author their, and their Absolutely. platform and their personality. And you have to instill confidence in the publisher from the beginning that you can bring that, that you're not just bringing them a good book, but you're also bringing them uh, a, a partner. And the reason that that partnership is so critical is that every single book is a business. It's, a, it's starting, every single book is a new business, a small business at first. It's, it's a new, it's, as the author, it's basically a new startup. It's a new startup, absolutely. You as the author are the, are the founder the publisher is your first venture capital investor and you two have to have a connection that means that their resources and their experience is going to add value to your book and your drive and energy and imagination is going to bring the spark to this new product that you're not going to this new business you're going to build in the world together publishers sometimes forget that they are basically uh, cap venture capital investors they're actually very good at that they, they're entrepreneurs starting businesses with new founders over and over and over again and go into it with that mindset can can help catalyze the conversations you can have with with a book publisher uh and then just one more thing to, to you know don't give up right you're go, you're going to get a lot of rejections from publishers for a long time until you find that connection um maybe in a moment we can talk about the self-publishing option but certainly if you want to find a book publisher that is a publishing company with a brand uh those are some of the key takeaways mm -hmm. You gave me one of the best explanations of re every rejection is is basically a redirection with regards yeah. to you getting rejected from different publishers. And I think what a lot of authors and a lot of book writers can possibly also do as well to reduce amount, the amount of rejection based on what you shared with me is to go to bookstores and look for books by authors they are written, they are written something very similar to what they are writing and mm -hmm. look for the publisher that published that book and probably yeah. shortlist a list of those publishers because those are the, those, those, those are the type of publishers that basically would feel like we can, we could make this book work. Yeah, absolutely. We're also, to some extent, I think lucky in South Africa that Publishers accept manuscript submissions directly from authors for the most part in South Africa. In the more developed book by markets of, of Europe and the US, you pretty much have to go through an agent, which means you go to you essentially uh, you need an agent to represent you to publishers. And that's really only because the publishers can't even begin to deal with the volume of books coming at them, submissions mm. coming at them, and, and agents form a, have a kind of curation role to play yes. in only showing to the publishers the ones the agents believe in. And then the agents, for their efforts, get a, a cut of, of whatever royalties uh, their authors earn. In South Africa, we have almost no literary agents. You know, there are probably a you, half a dozen in the whole country you are so you're pretty much going direct to publishers and you are your yes. own agent essentially you're your own agent absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the way it is <laughs> you know you mentioned cut and i'm actually yeah. quite curious what hmm. what kind of money do does the average um writer make in south africa yeah great question um okay so let's break down the numbers a little bit 
For now, I'm going to talk about what would be a very conventional book publishing contract. By conventional, that means that probably 70 to 80% of author contracts for general interest books, so the kind of books you'd buy in PNA or exclusive books or bargain books, uh, would have. So I'm not including school books. They have a very different model uh, or university textbooks. I'm talking about the kinds of books that you might write. At least I'm guessing the kind of book you're probably working on. So 80% of those contracts probably say to the author that the author will earn, let's say 12% of net receipts. So what does that mean? The publisher is going to produce the book and they're going to ask booksellers to sell that book. So let's say the bookseller is going to sell the book for 200 rand. Of course, the book's probably going to be more expensive than that these days because books are stupidly mm. expensive, but 200 is a nice round number to work with. Okay. So of that 200 rand, almost 100 rand will go to the bookstore. Let's call it 40% of that. So 80 rand will go to the bookstore. So that's 120 rand that will go to the publisher when the book is actually sold. Okay. So if, if the bookseller can't sell the book, in most cases, the bookseller will simply return it to the publisher and there will be no sale, right? So the bookseller is not the customer, the end customer must buy the book. So let's imagine someone actually buys the copy of the book and the publisher gets 120 Rand from the bookseller. The author, as I said, is earning 12% of net receipts. That 120 Rand is the net receipts. It's what the publisher receives after the bookseller's cut. So 12% of 120 rand, I don't have a calculator on me, but it's, let's call it about 15 rand. So that's about 15 rand per copy actually sold in a bookstore is what an author will receive. Now in South Africa, because we have a small book buyer market, and that's a whole other conversation about why you yeah. have a small book buyer market. In South Africa, generally 5,000 copies is considered a bestseller, which is surprisingly low. It's a great shame. I would love for 100,000 copies to be considered a bestseller. But the fact is in South Africa, five is, is up, it's really up there. Most publishers will print 800 to 1,000 copies of a book in its first print run and expect to take a year to sell that. So it's very, very low for most books. So let's say you sell 1,000 copies. Again, nice easy round number. And you're only mm -hmm. 15 rand a copy. That's 15,000 rand. And that could take a year to sell. So this is not going to pay your salary, right? <laughs> uh, 15,000 Rand in a year, and you will only receive that 15,000 Rand after that year is up when the royalties get calculated. Because in most cases, the publishers will calculate royalties once or twice a year. And that's got to do with the time frame it takes for booksellers even to try to sell the book. The bookseller usually gets a few months to try to sell the book. And, it, and then once those few months are up, they either send the book back or they pay the publisher for what they've sold. The publisher then collects all that together and once or twice a year will pay a royalty out to the, to the author. If on the other hand, you're, a, you're an author who's managed to negotiate a higher royalty, maybe you're earning 20 rand a book uh, and maybe your book sells 10,000 copies. Well, now you're looking at 20, at what, 40,000 rand. That's still not a year's salary that one could support a family on, but it's starting to seem like time worth spending on the book. 10, so those are the copies. kind of numbers most authors. So 10,000 copies at 20 around a copy. 20,000. 20, actually 20,000, right? 20,000, sorry, 20,000. No, that's, right. that's 20,000. 10,000 10, 10, copies? Yes, you're quite right. Yeah, 20,000, yeah. Yes, thank you. 200,000. There we go. I'm glad your maths is better than mine today. <laughs> so uh, so that's, that's starting to look like decent money. You could probably, um, at that point, start thinking about, hmm, could I do this with my next book? And, you know, maybe go half day on my job or, or, or go full time on this writing thing. So, um, but that is a, that's a whole next level to hit. Very few writers, unfortunately hit those levels. Um, but that's, that's probably, so for most writers in South Africa and most of the world, writing is very much a side project uh, until they get really, really um, either very good or really lucky. You know, I wish we have a lot more time, but I have to, but we have to sort of like round off because I would love to dig more, dig more into why South Africans do not read. Okay. Um, mm. But that's, that, that is something that I will hopefully get a chance to ask you um, some other time. And I want to ask you one last question, which a lot of people, which people have asked me and I'm like, I don't know. 
<laughs> how many books and is there a time period for you to sell a number of books for it to be considered a South African bestseller? How many do you have to sell and what's the cutoff um, time frame? Mm. Yeah, I think it's very much, you know, depends who you ask, you'll get a different answer. But I think that the answer I hear most is 5,000 books in a year. Uh, so one year of 5,000 books, most South African publishers would say, oh, that was one of our bestsellers. Uh, the word <laughs> bestseller, you know, can be interpreted in any way. But uh, that's, I would say, the conventional wisdom of most South African publishers. Once you're topping 5,000 in a year, then uh, that's one of the top books in the, in the country. Yeah, I think it was bestseller. There are some that sell many more. But uh, mm. there are there are occasionally a book will come along, you know, by I don't know, the coach of the Springboks will come along and sell a hundred thousand copies. Uh, but uh, but most books, yeah, five five, five to ten thousand copies in a year would, would definitely be a bestseller. I think the word bestseller in marketing it's more of a social proofing, where uh, mm. which shows people which which stuff like encourages more people to buy your book because it shows that your book was interesting enough for it to. I've sold enough to become a bestseller. And that's, I feel, does that actually work um, with books? Does it, does a book sell a lot more? Is it like a exponential increase in sales once it hits that bestseller and, and, and then is it marketed as a bestseller? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the way that most of us buy books is because someone we trust says this is a good book. And the more we see a book, uh, the more likely we are to trust that it's worth our money. As we said, books are expensive, right? So you're only going to invest in it once you really know this book's going to add to your life. And, uh, and the more people that are adding it to their life, the, the more the book is good. So some publishers will experiment with ways to make books appear to be bestsellers even before they are in order to trigger that network effect of people recommending it. Uh, but that's a, an alchemy, a kind of art uh, that uh, I suppose is for a marketing discussion that, I wouldn't consider myself an expert in, but it's a fascinating area. Thank you so much. Are you, are, you, are you happy? Am I happy? I am happy. I am a very lucky person. I have, uh, I have had many things in my life go very well and I'm very grateful for that. So I am happy and hopefully that will stay the case. And if you had a message for the world, what would it be? I think it would be to be kind. At the moment, the world is arguing a lot. We see it most on Twitter about what it means to be a human and a good human. And at the end of the day, if you're a kind person, I don't think there's anything more important. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. That's it. Cool. Done. I enjoyed Done. it. Yeah, man. Thank Thanks you. a lot, man. Oh, Dude, you dropped a lot of, lot of um, tips there. You know, um, so we're gonna make the title "How to Write," how to write, um, how to write and publish a bestseller in South Africa, and to hopefully hit the hit the SEO um, search for videos in South Africa on YouTube for that particular topic because I feel like that's something a lot of people these days are searching for. And we hope that, cool. yeah, we hope this is going to be able to just, just give people a lot of information for them to actually go forward with this. This, this right. was very, very good. Thank you so much. I appreciate it so Thank much. You. Yeah. I really appreciate your inviting me and good questions. And I love talking about this stuff. So yeah, anytime. Okay. Great stuff. And if ever you want to do another episode about why people don't read, well, I don't have answers to that. But I'm involved <laughs> in some quite cool projects that um, particularly run books for children that could be quite fun to talk about as well so uh, who knows maybe maybe another time but on good luck for the podcast i think it's really great I, i've listened to uh, a, a number of the episodes earlier today just getting my mind in the in the groove and uh, it's good stuff so appreciate uh, what you're doing man all right thanks a lot man <laughs>